Good morning. Uh, welcome to the April 30th, 2019 uh, meeting of the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. The committee will come to order, and without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. Today, we will set the table for the Select Committee's work on the biggest challenge before us, how to decarbonize the economy in accordance with climate science while creating family sustaining jobs and building a more equitable society. For the benefit of the witnesses, I want to note that members will be coming in and out of the hearing. Mr. Lujan is with the speaker meeting with the president about infrastructure and several members are chairing or trying to fit in multiple hearings. Uh, I'll recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. This is the first of many select committee hearings that is focused on solutions to the climate crisis. The need for solutions is increasingly urgent. The first major warning Congress received about the impending climate crisis was in 1988, but the Congress didn't act then. Uh, and today, we know that oil companies own scientists warned them about climate change too. But instead of action, executives chose to tell Congress and the American people to ignore the scientists and that we could afford to wait. Well, now the climate science is too unequivocal to deny. What is clear from the science and what diverse voices, including many young people across America, are telling us every day is that Congress, that is, they tell us that if Congress continues to delay, we lose. If Congress chooses the status quo, we lose. In fact, scientists have told us that the world needs to hit net zero carbon emissions by 2050 to avoid the worst consequences of the climate crisis. Getting there means cutting greenhouse gas pollution 45% below 2010 levels by 2030. To get there, and to give ourselves a chance of avoiding the most catastrophic consequences of climate change, we have to cut carbon pollution smartly and soon. Taking action now gives us the best opportunity to transition to a clean energy economy efficiently and equitably. We still have time to solve the climate crisis because we've made some good choices. Raising fuel economy standards, supporting wind and solar jobs, and investing in research and development that's coming to fruition now. America chose to lead the world in the Paris Climate Agreement, an agreement vital to the clean energy jobs and innovations underway in America right now. But every time Congress and the administration choose delay, American families and businesses are asked to pay a higher price, whether it's through climate catastrophes, extreme heat, dirtier air, or higher electric bills. But as dawning as the climate crisis is, we can make choices and rise to the challenge. Many businesses and communities across America have been leading the way. More than three million Americans work in the clean energy economy. Existing energy efficiency standards will save consumers and businesses $2 trillion on utility bills by 2030. And fuel economy standards will save the average household another $2,800 a year at the pump. Still, there is no substitute for bold federal policy initiatives that meet the scale of the challenge we face. When we choose clear policies with clear goals, businesses innovate. They reduce cost. They put clean, clean technology to work. Our witnesses today will help us examine and prioritize our policy choices. We're going to look at infrastructure, at deploying more wind and solar, at electrifying home heating and transportation, at cutting the most powerful climate pollutants and more. We're also going to look at funding research and development and establishing public-private partnerships that move technology from the lab to the market. We're going to look at capturing and storing carbon and pulling it out of the atmosphere. But we have to be clear, technological breakthroughs are not guaranteed. Choosing to invest in innovation doesn't give us an excuse to choose the status quo elsewhere. At the end of the day, technology is just a tool. It's people who will solve the climate crisis. The clean energy economy employs millions of people, and we can choose policies that will make those jobs family-sustaining jobs. That includes elevating transition for workers in the fossil fuel industry. 
They deserve a clean energy economy that delivers for them in their communities. We need good and patriotic policies for them, too. And we need climate solutions that work. We have to pursue many options to meet our goals by 2030 and 2050. The one option we don't have anymore is delay. We must choose climate action now. And at this time, I'll yield to my friend and colleague, the ranking member, Mr. Graves, for an opening statement. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to address the committee. I hope everybody had a fantastic Easter and uh, welcome back. Um, witnesses, I want to thank you all for, for being here. I apologize, didn't uh, come, come tell you hello this morning, but thank you all for, for uh, submitting testimony. I did have a chance to go through all your testimony, and I appreciate you making the efforts to be here today. Um, uh, Madam Chair, first of all, I, I want to reiterate what, I, what I've talked about in the past. Uh, climate change is real. Humans are having a contribution to it. And congressional districts like the one that I represent, that Congressman Carter represents, uh, the effects of, of sea rise and other challenges are having real impacts on our communities today. Um, I, I, I think that what we have to do moving forward is be very thoughtful, be responsible, and make sure that we're bringing people to the table that actually have experience in working in these fields, as opposed to folks setting targets, objectives, and goals that lack any degree of science or reality. Uh, importantly, what we have to do is we have to very carefully think about some of these multilateral agreements like Paris and look at the cumulative effect of them and determine whether or not these truly have a, a, will provide a global benefit, uh, a global environmental benefit, or have adverse consequences. For example, uh, Madam Chair, I think it's important to note um, that you can look at, at what the European Climate Action, Action Network determined. Uh, they determined that all European countries are currently not, they are not on a trajectory to actually hit their Paris Accord targets, uh, that they would have to triple their efforts today in order to come into compliance with those targets, and that their targets to begin with are insufficient. So, so l let me say that again. The European Union nations are, are not hitting their targets. They're not a, on a trajectory to hit their targets. That they would have to triple their efforts and that their, their targets to begin with were, were insufficient. Um, something else that's really important for us to think about, and one of the biggest flaws in the, in the Paris Accord is the fact that you have China that doesn't even have to reduce emissions, doesn't even have to reduce emissions for, for, for several years and is already more than offsetting the impact of emissions reductions in the United States. Now, I also think that it's important to make note of, um, of another uh, really important fact. Um, the, the IEA, the International Energy Agency, in their, in their recent uh, Global Energy and CO2 Status Report, I want to read a quote from it because, because we can sit here and continue demonizing the United States or we can talk facts. Um, in, in their report, they say in the United States, the emissions reductions seen in 2017 were reversed. Our emissions reductions were reversed with an increase of 3.1% of CO2 emissions in 2018. You've seen lots of reporting on that. Okay, so folks are looking myopically at 17 and 18. Now let's actually look even farther back. Despite this increase, Emissions in the United States remained around their 1990 levels, 14 percent and 800 metric tons of CO2 below the peak in 2000. Now, here's the kicker statement. This is the largest absolute decline among all countries since 2000. We've got to stop this ridiculousness of beating up on the United States. We've got to recognize that we're actually doing extraordinary things without mandates requirements that we're doing, experiencing extraordinary reductions in the United States. We've got to stop these, these utopian concepts like Green New Deal and other things that lack any degree of reality, that, that lack any input from actual experts in these fields. And we've got to realize that the Paris Accords with the China-India de developing country targets, calling China developing country, is fascinating to me, using entirely different metrics on how they're reducing emissions. All this is doing is resulting in a net adverse impact to our global environment while undermining the competition or the competitiveness of U.S. workforce and U.S. economy. Madam Chair, I, I look forward to, to working with you to build upon some of the successes and also learning from some of the failures of previous administrations to try and reduce emissions, particularly 
looking at the impacts in Ms. Miller's district, looking at the impact in Mr. Griffith's district um, of some of these flawed policies and moving forward in a direction like we're seeing in Louisiana where we're exporting natural gas to 35 countries today and resulting in lower emissions. Uh, Mr. Foster, I want to particularly thank you for your thoughtful testimony. Um, I, I think that you, you've come across very balanced and being very realistic. I enjoyed reading your testimony. I thought it was very good, Mr. Guth. You, you as well. I want to thank you all um, for just being thoughtful and realistic in your testimony. We often have people come in here that just throw out these, these things that aren't based, and I'm not, I'm not beating up on you all in any way, but, but you, you had a very balanced and thoughtful, realistic approach in your testimony, and I do appreciate you being here. Um, I'm over time, so I'm going to go ahead and, and shut up, but I want to thank you all again. Thank you very much to the ranking member. The, the United States of America has, has been a world leader, and we should keep it that way. Uh, now I want to welcome our witnesses. First, we have Dr. Diana Liverman, who is a professor of geography at the Uni University of Arizona. Dr. Liverman served as a lead author for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's report on limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Her research focuses on how climate change affects people including historically disempowered groups, and how society can adapt to climate change. Mr. Hal Harvey, uh, here at the end, is CEO of Energy Innovation, an energy and environmental policy firm. Harvey founded the Energy Foundation and has served on federal energy panels under the George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton administrations. In 2018, he received the United Nations Clean Air and Climate Change Award, and he is the author of two books on energy and climate. Mr. David Foster is a distinguished associate with the Energy Futures Initiative, a think tank started by energy security uh, former Energy Secretary Ernest Moniz. Foster served as a senior advisor to Secretary Moniz at the Department of Energy and was the founding executive director of the Blue-Green Alliance, a partnership between unions and environmental organizations. From 1990 to 2006, Foster was director of the U.S. Steelworkers, District 11, a 13-state region based in Minneapolis. Welcome. And Mr. Chris Christopher Guth is acting president and CEO of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's Global Energy Institute. Previously, Guth served as a deputy assistant secretary in the George W. Bush administration and worked in the offices of Representatives Bob Barr and Tim Murphy. Without objection, the witnesses' written statements will be made part of the record. With that, uh, we will go, Dr. Lim uh, Liverman, then to Mr. Guth and go down the table this way. So without objection, the witnesses' written statements will be made part of the record. Uh, Dr. Liverman, you are now recognized for to give a five-minute uh, presentation on your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman Castor, Ranking Member Graves, and distinguished members of the committee. Good morning, and thank you for the invitation to give testimony at today's hearing. My name's Diana Liverman. I'm a professor at the University of Arizona, where we are proud to host federally funded centers for the Climate Assessment for the Southwest with NOAA and the Department of Interior Regional Climate Science Center. We also have a center for climate adaptation science and solutions that made many contributions to the US national climate assessments. I've studied climate change and its impacts for 40 years. I wrote my PhD on climate change and food security at UCLA and the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Colorado. I've worked at the University of Wisconsin, Penn State, and Oxford University. And although I've been a US citizen for 30 years, I've retained my British accent because students in my classes are apparently finding it more interesting and more convincing. You invited me to speak about the recent special report of IPCC on global warming of 1.5 Celsius, requested by countries as part of the decision to adopt the Paris Agreement. I was the lead author for chapter five of the main report, nominated by the US government, and I also contributed substantially to the summary for policymakers. We released the report written by 91 authors from 40 countries in October 2018. We assessed more than 6,000 scientific studies, and received over 40,000 comments from governments, scientists, and other expert reviewers that helped us improve the report. What did the report conclude? My written testimony provides much more detail, but let me summarize some of the key messages. 
First, the Earth has already warmed on average by one degree Celsius. That's about 1.8 Fahrenheit, even more over land and towards the poles. And we were already seeing impacts and losses from the warming. In the US, the warming's been greatest in Alaska, but also in the Southwest, where I live, where the annual average temperature has increased since 1901, with parts of Southern California and Arizona warming by more than four degrees Fahrenheit. Warming has led to lower flows on the Colorado, increased the risk of wildfires across the West, it's altering our ecosystems, and stressing the electrical grid and agriculture. It's already increased the risk of species extinction, shifted agricultural zones, and affected human health. Tucson, where I live, now has 25 more days above 100 degrees Fahrenheit than it did in 1970. This heat has especially affected our most vulnerable citizens, the poor, the elderly, children, as well as tribal members, people of color, and folks who work outdoors. Many people can't afford the increased air conditioning and water costs. Secondly, every bit of warming matters. The IPCC found significant differences in climate and impacts between 1.5 Celsius and 2 Celsius. That's 2.7 and 3.6 Fahrenheit. For example, sea level rise by 2100 would be six inches more at two degrees with added re risks if ice sheets become more unstable. Even a few inches of sea level rise increase the risks of coastal flooding, saltwater intrusion, and damage to infrastructure. The loss of habitat for many insects, plants, and animals doubles even with that extra half degree. Fire risk is higher and fisheries are more disturbed. At one and a half degrees Celsius, we lose about 70% of tropical corals. At two degrees, they disappear. Poverty increases by several hundred million, and in many regions, water stress and heat wave deaths double, agricultural production declines, and diseases can increase. My third point is that we can reduce losses now, and at 1.5 degrees Celsius, if we focus on adapting to ongoing warming. Limiting warming to 1.5 Celsius makes adaptation easier and less costly. U.S. communities and businesses are already making costly adaptations to cope with observed warming. The University of Arizona is working with stakeholders across the Southwest, water managers, conservation scientists, farmers, and communities to develop and implement adaptation solutions. Fourth, limiting warming to 1.5 is possible. The world is not on track if we want to limit warming to 1.5. The IPCC concluded that the voluntary commitments pledged so far under the Paris Agreement still take us to three degrees. But there is a chance to stay under one and a half if we cut emissions in half by 2030 and reach net zero emissions by 2050. The US can make important contributions to the rapid and far-reaching transitions in energy, land, urban infrastructure, and industrial systems that could help limit warming to 1.5. Delaying emission reductions could be very costly. If we choose to delay, we may lose the chance to stay under one and a half degrees Celsius, or we will have to make deeper and more expensive cuts in emissions, rely on untested technologies, experience greater losses, or adapt to higher temperatures. Halving emissions by 2030, starting now, sets us on the path to success. The world will not end if we don't make these emission cuts by 2030, but that world will be much harder for us to live in. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. Guth, you are now recognized to give a five-minute presentation on your testimony. Thank you. Good morning, Chairwoman Castor, Ranking Member Graves, and members of the committee. The U.S. Chamber appreciates the opportunity to testify today on the important role of technology and innovation in addressing climate change. Global climate change is one of the most complex and far-reaching issues facing governments and, business, and the business community. The Chamber recognizes that the climate is changing, humans are con contributing to these changes, and these changes pose risks. The question for business and policymakers is how best to manage these risks, capture opportunities, and maintain our global economic leadership. But inaction is not an option. The Chamber believes there is much common ground in which all sides of this discussion could come together to craft a practical, flexible, predictable, and durable approach to climate change that acknowledges the costs of action and inaction and the competitiveness of the U.S. economy. Because the business community will be integral to developing and providing cost-effective solutions and building resilient infrastructure, it will continue to be at the table. 
The chamber believes that technology and innovation are integral to managing climate risks and reducing emissions across the U.S. as well as the globe. Instead of regulating our way to lower emissions, a realistic, effective, and lasting climate policy should focus on innovating our way to technological solutions. Breakthroughs in commercially viable technology are necessary to enable significant cuts in emissions without harming economic growth or competitiveness of energy-intensive and trade-exposed industries. Existing technologies have started us on the path, but they are not capable of significantly reducing greenhouse gas emissions on a global scale at an acceptable cost. New, and in some cases revolutionary, technologies will have to be developed and adopted commercially along with the infrastructure to support them. Some of these technologies may never reach viability, but that does not mean we shirk the duty of trying to develop them. A technology-neutral, solutions-focused climate policy is best positioned to stand the test of time and deliver cost-effective, achievable, and meaningful greenhouse gas reductions. In the meantime, we should continue to develop our domestic energy resources, which provide our businesses a critical operating advantage in today's intensely competitive global economy. We should work to preserve that advantage, recognizing that disproportionate international commitments could cause American industrial capacity to move to other countries through carbon leakage. A policy that promotes continued economic growth and environmental progress through sustained focus on technology development, where what we at the Chamber call the cleaner, stronger approach, is much more popular with the voting public compared to an approach centered on uh, expanded government regulation. Last month, we commissioned a national poll that found 79% of voters agree that the best way to address climate change is through investment in innovation and technology, which was a 24-point advantage over increased government regulation. Additionally, voters prefer a cleaner, stronger focus to a Green New Deal approach by more than three to one. And finally, more than 64% of voters would spend no more than $10 a month to address climate change. These results underpin the Chamber's efforts to promote, to promote bipartisan federal policies and investments that spur technologies that can reduce environmental impact and compete on price and reliability. It will largely be up to the business community to develop, finance, build, and operate the solutions needed to power economic growth worldwide while mitigating greenhouse gas emissions. Thousands of businesses already have made emissions commitments and are taking action to reduce emissions in their own operations and along their value chains. To draw attention to what the energy industry is doing, last summer we launched a new initiative to highlight that the energy industry has been one of, if not the most innovative industries over the last decade. Our program, called Energy Innovates, highlights specific innovative projects and technologies, as well as the forward thinkers, engineers, and manufacturers responsible for, for their development. This summer, the Chamber is hosting an Energy Innovation Summit to, to help policymakers here in Washington better conceptualize the exciting development happening across the country. Climate change is a global challenge, and U.S. technological leadership will be vital in addressing and de developing country emission trends. Virtually all future greenhouse gas emission growth is, ex is expected to come from developing countries. Much of these increases are related to a sharp increase in coal-fired electricity generation expected to be built there. As such, technology and innovation will be even more important in addressing developing country emission trends. Make no mistake, the developing world's desire for greater energy access is not an argument for an action. As we have stated, an action is not an option. However, failure to recognize the global nature of climate change leads to a solution set that is ineffective. Advanced technologies that compete with traditional fuels on cost, reliability, and scalability can reconcile the sometimes competing quest for energy access and desire for emissions reductions. Technology supported by sound policy will be essential to tackling the challenges and capitalizing on the opportunities presented by climate change. The Chamber will continue to support an accelerated program to improve performance, lower the cost, and increase scalability of energy technologies. There are a number of near-term legislative actions on which there is broad consensus, such as technology and innovation, that the Chamber supports and on which Congress could act. I've listed several in my written testimony, and we encourage all of you to co-sponsor these bills. America's business community is ready, willing, and able to continue to provide the solutions to reduce emissions while growing the economy. With a sensible policy environment that plays America's strengths and business leadership, we can continue making our economy cleaner and stronger an approach focusing on solutions offers a practical path forward that makes good sense and good business sense. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you very much. Mr. Foster, you'll not, you are now recognized for five minutes. Great. Thank you, and good morning, uh, Chairwoman.
Pastor and uh, Ranking Member Graves and Hal Harvey for turning the mic on. I'm pleased to be here today on behalf of the Energy Futures Initiative to speak to the important issue of the energy and energy efficiency workforces. Twelve years ago in 2007, I testified to the Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming. At that time, I stated one of the most famous American industrialists of the 20th century, Henry J. Kaiser, once observed, quote, problems are just opportunities in work clothes. Well, 12 years later, I'm pleased to report that millions of Americans have put on their work clothes and got about the business of solving climate change. Today, of the 6.7 million Americans who work in the energy and energy efficiency industries, over 3.5 million, more than 50%, are contributing to a lower emissions economy. 350,000 of them do this in the wind and solar energy industries, another 63,000 in nuclear power plants, 66,000 in hydro, 70,000 in low emissions advanced natural gas generating plants, and thousands of others in geothermal, combined heat and power, battery storage, and many other technologies, including several hundred at the first coal-fired power plant retrofitted with carbon capture technology at the Petronova generating station just south of Houston, Texas. If it's done right, with the interests of America's middle class and working families at heart, there will be a place at the table, a job and a paycheck for every American while we solve the climate crisis. But we do have to do it right. Most of the Americans whose jobs are reducing greenhouse gas emissions today are working with energy efficiency technologies. In fact, almost 2.35 million people work in energy efficiency in the United States retrofitting our buildings, installing LED lighting systems, and manufacturing high-efficiency HVAC systems, and hundreds of other ENERGY STAR certified products. In transportation, almost 254,000 Americans now work manufacturing, designing hybrids, all electrics and plug-in hybrids, while another 486,000 work in the motor vehicles component parts industry specifically on those products that make our automotive fuel consumption more efficient. This is how we solve climate change, by doing the hard work every day and getting a paycheck from construction work, factory jobs, from mining critical minerals like copper, iron ore, and palladium, and designing, financing, and permitting the systems and products that create our low-carbon economy. So what are some of the effective job strategies for dealing with the disparities that are inevitable in the transition to a low-carbon economy? First, we need to embrace an all-of-the-above flexible strategy toward climate solutions. There is no silver bullet that can guide our economy to a low-carbon endpoint, guaranteeing CO2 reductions and a decent job for every American. But we can invest in a range of technologies and options that preserve flexibility, and encourage participation in every form of energy and in every community during the next decade, from renewables and battery storage in California to carbon capture and sequestration in Appalachia to small modular reactors in Idaho. Second, we need to accelerate our investments in energy efficiency with a special priority on those regions of the country negatively impacted by declining use of fossil fuels. A third strategy is to invest in energy infrastructure. The existing DOE loan program office with $39 billion of existing loan authority could be particularly helpful in jumpstarting such an initiative. Fourth, we need to focus on the manufacturing supply chains that our new energy technologies are creating. The Energy Star brand promoted by the US EPA is one of the strongest product marketing brands in the world recognized as the gold standard for efficiency. Using a new Energy Star Made in America procurement policy to support the manufacture of best-in-class products would be one of the best paths forward to a resurgence in American manufacturing. Carbon performance should be a universal procurement standard for government spending in the US, similar to what California recently did with its Buy Clean standard. Finally, we need to address the the uh, workforce development crisis across all energy technologies, but particularly in energy efficiency. In 2017, energy efficiency construction employers had projected hiring at 10.6% or over 120,000 new jobs. 
but the reality of hiring difficulty got in the way and they added only 21,000 jobs in 2018. This was a failure of our workforce development system with very real world consequences. From the environmental perspective, millions of tons of CO2 went into the atmosphere that could have been prevented. But from the human perspective, this represented over 100,000 families that could have entered the middle class with some of the best paying jobs in America. I want to close by thanking the committee again for the opportunity to testify. With sound economic analysis, accurate jobs data, and a collaborative approach, we can manage our path to a low carbon economy by investing in new opportunities and new jobs first before we put old technologies on the shelf. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Foster. Mr. Harvey, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ranking Member, and all the other members here. It's a great honor to be here today. I'm an engineer by education. <clears throat> I have decades of experience in finance, in technology, in public policy, and in engineering and construction. And I've come here today to offer options that I think are practical and that will appeal to both sides of the aisle. As honored as I am to address this august body, uh, I have to say it's especially important. I have my son with me today. Um, so he can witness my work, um, but especially because we all have a deep obligation to our children to give them a planet as bountiful as the one we inherited. We cannot shirk that duty. My approach in thinking about energy policy is to think about the four qualities that Americans need with their energy. They need affordable, reliable, clean, and safe. It's these attributes that are the public policy goals, not a specific technology. And the right kinds of policy can produce those attributes. And here's the big picture, and it's pretty terrific. It is now cheaper to save the planet than to ruin it. I appreciate the testimony from the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, it should have been written 10 years ago because the technologies are here today. We've had amazing advances in batteries, in electric vehicles, onshore wind, offshore wind, 3D printing, solar, LED bulbs, industrial control systems, heat pumps, and more. And so it's now cheaper in many, many circumstances to dr drastically reduce climate change than to keep going with business as usual. The key missing ingredient is the right kind of policy. Do we want to reward those characteristics of affordable, reliable, clean, and safe? Or do we want to protect incumbent technologies? Let me offer an example. My team analyzed every single coal-fired power plant in America, the, the economics of them. Three quarters of them now cost more simply to operate than replacing them within 35 miles with solar and wind. So it's cheaper to take those same locations, those same transmission lines, and the same workers and give them a better job in clean energy than to keep running those old power plants. It's also better for the economy because it saves consumers money. People worry about reliability with clean energy. The, the states in America, and this is our, our uh, great experiment in democracy, that have adopted strong wind energy standards have more have increased the reliability of their grid. It moves you in the proper direction, not the wrong direction. So let me offer four policy ideas, uh, but also mention in my written testimony, we off, we've, we've worked on a, a comprehensive strategy that I, I uh, urge you to take a look at. The, the first policy I would recommend is to require that the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission be a merit-driven, technology-neutral, adjudicatory body to re required to run the power system at the lowest cost. That seems straightforward, and that seems like a bipartisan idea. And in fact, that's the way the FERC has worked for years, but in the last two years, they've started to put the thumb on the scale for certain technologies. And in my mind, that's a Soviet-era thinking. That's not what America should be all about. Second, we should set performance targets for our grid. I would argue for 80% zero carbon electricity by 2035. This is ambitious, but it's realistic, and it's cost-effective. It will save consumers money. If you don't believe me, check out Iowa or Kansas or Texas or Oklahoma or California, which have different geographies, different policies, uh, or different political situations, but are all benefiting from incredible rapid adoption of clean energy technology. We worked in Texas when George W. Bush was governor, and he signed the, first, the second renewable portfolio standard in the country, uh, and it's been a huge success. The third option I would offer for your consideration is let's have, make sure America builds the most efficient, clean cars on the planet. We need to accelerate the energy efficiency standards and accelerate the transition to zero emission vehicles. Ranking Member Graves, I have traveled to China more than 70 times. I've worked in a dozen countries on energy policy, and I tell you, 
They have a lot of bad stuff to fix, but they're working hard on it. And they're moving in the transition to electric vehicles, I'm afraid, a lot faster than we are. We don't want to have China own that technology. That should be an American technology, in my opinion. The fourth recommendation I would offer <clears throat> is to make sure that the affected communities in this transition are treated properly. So think of the coal mining towns in West Virginia. We should have an environmental restoration project of significant scale so that the same people in the same communities with similar skills can be part of the solution and can be supported for that. They've helped deliver low-cost electricity to this country for 100 years. Let's not walk away from that now. Let's begin a serious environmental restoration project. I see my time is running up. Let me offer a concluding thought. My work is organized around solutions, practical solutions, based on economics, based on engineering. But I must have done something horrible in a previous life because I also have to keep up on the climate science. The climate science. And I'm here to tell you that if we don't act and don't act rapidly, we will leave a much impoverished earth to our children. We will walk away from the America we recognize and create FEMA world, and nobody here wants that. So we need to do the right thing, and we need to do it rapidly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of the witnesses for your outstanding testimony. Uh, at this time, I'll recognize myself for five minutes for questions. Uh, Dr. Liverman, the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, said that the global community needs to achieve net zero emissions by 2050 uh, to limit warm, warming, but it doesn't specify the country by country reductions. Uh, you've heard some of the, the comments up here that, gosh, the U.S. can't do it on its own. What does, but what does the scientific literature say about what the U.S. needs to do in order to achieve that global goal? And what's your uh, response to, uh, gosh, throw up our hands because other countries may not be moving fast enough either? Well, the scientific literature is considerable, uh, looking at different countries' responsibility for emissions and what criteria one might use to decide what a, an equitable or uh, politically feasible response might be. So one of the issues is that carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for a number of years. So what we emitted 50 years ago is still around contributing to warming. So there are several alternatives, several choices that might uh, distribute responsibility for emissions. Um, if you use current emissions, then certainly China is now higher than the United States. But historically, in terms of accumulated emissions, the US still is the highest. We've done more to contribute to warming than any other country. We also have very high per capita emissions, 20 tons, compared to a world average of about six. So depending on which of those allocation criteria we look at uh, in our research, the US could bear a larger responsibility for emissions than a 50% um, reduction by 2030. Um, but that negotiation is something that is done in the political arena. Scientists are just pointing out what the various choices would be and what the implications might be in terms of the fair responsibility of the United States. Well, clearly we're behind the eight ball because we the U.S. has put off climate action uh, for so long, that, that dramatic transition to the clean energy economy. Uh, Mr. Foster, you say this is a, an outstanding opportunity to uh, create clean energy jobs and lower utility bills for consumers. Help us prioritize as we look to putting together a, a report for, for the United States and for uh, citizens in the Congress. Where, where do we start? Well, one of the, the projects that we started when I worked at the Department of Energy was the collection of uh, jobs data on energy jobs and energy efficiency, an annual study that we've continued for the last four years. What I think it shows us is that the big bulk of an immediate economic impact on Americans is in the field of energy efficiency. We have an outstanding record. We have 2.35 million Americans who work in that uh, area. Uh, very heavily dominated by construction, but over 320,000 manufacturing jobs. Many of those manufacturing jobs making that energy efficient uh, equipment are located in coal states. Uh, six of the top 15 are among those. 
It's no accident that places where we once mined coal produced cheap energy and led to a manufacturing uh, cluster in all those states, so to speak. So investments, uh, picking up projects like the old 48C Advanced Energy Manufacturing Tax Credit to spark the growth of manufacturing and clean energy, energy efficiency technologies would be one of the smartest things we could do to drive economic development in places that have been negatively impacted. And, and Mr. Harvey, you've laid out some significant recommendations for us. You also have authored a book, Climate Solutions, that is a very good rom roadmap for policymakers. Uh, and you highlight that we better get started in the energy sector. Could you elaborate, please? Certainly. So there are four big sectors in American energy, or any country's energy, which is the electric grid, transportation, buildings, and industry. They have separate pathways, although they're obviously connected. Um, and one needs to have policy for each one that understands the dynamics of, of that one. Uh, the technology advancement for the electric grid has been dramatic. Um, and it is now driven so that the lowest cost electricity on the planet uh, is solar and wind. And we have many more options on the way. By the way, I'm completely in favor of technology, more advanced technologies. I just want to use what we have already right away mm -hmm. and keep developing the next generation. Um, so the electric grid can be decarbonized uh, at a savings to consumers so long as the policy is properly designed. And what do I mean by that? This is very important. You need a long-term target that has high certainty. Companies need flexibility on how to get there. Pol uh, targets should be technology neutral and they should be price finding. They should not be driven by arbitrary diktat. If you do those things, you liberate the free market and all its innovation to find the solution. It doesn't mean you soften the goal at all. It means you create enough of a horizon and enough certainty and enough flexibility that you achieve it at the lowest possible cost. Thank you very much. Mr. Graves, you, you're going to yield to Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter, good morning. Good morning. You were recognized <laughs> for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank each and every one of you for being here. We appreciate this. This is very, very helpful to us as a committee, and we all take this very seriously. Climate change is real. The climate's been changing since day one, and protecting our environment is real. We all understand that. Mr. Guth, I'm going to start with you. Um, I, I, too, as, as um, Ranking Member Graves mentioned, I, I read your, re, your report as well and found it to be very interesting and, and very balanced, and I appreciate that. I wanted to ask you specifically about um, something you mentioned. You mentioned a number of private um, sector businesses that are already making investments in, in, in their own in their own right to, to fight climate change. Can you just talk just a little bit uh, about that and maybe just a few examples? Absolutely, thank you for the opportunity. I didn't get a chance to, to go over it in the, the oral test testimony, but in my, my written testimony, we hi I highlighted a couple of uh, specific projects that I think are emblematic of what U.S. business has been doing over the last decade. Um, and we feature these in our Energy Innovates program. Um, the most recent one we just, uh, module we just put on our website last week was San Diego Gas and Electric, who constructed what at the time was the world's largest um, stationary storage facility. It's been now surpassed by one in Australia, but I'm sure there will be a, a race to the top to see who can make the most efficient um, and frankly, uh, largest dispatchable battery. Uh, advanced reactor um, at, at, at new scale. It's a small modular reactor. It's a revolutionary design that can be used uh, globally and in places where you wouldn't necessarily put a, a large scale reactor um, like we, we use right now. Um, and then one that is incredibly important um, just outside of, of, of uh, Houston, Texas, um, a project being, being built by um, uh, a consortium of companies that stands to be the first zero emissions uh, natural gas plant that would be competitive with I've actually seen that. off the shelf natural gas. Yeah. Net yeah. power. Yeah. It's a well, great project. Yeah. And, and you bring out some great examples. Let me ask you this. Um, as is often the case in Congress, with the best of intentions, we, we put in government regulations to, to encourage these type of things. So you think that it's possible that putting more requirements, it, 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 the government putting more requirements on these businesses um, to fight climate change in specific ways could do just the opposite, and that is it could, it could hinder their ability? Uh, absolutely. I think um, even with the best intentions, um, American history and probably uh, the history of democracy globally is littered with unintended consequences. I mean, we see, we see state by state and sometimes even national policies are um, creating headwind for nuclear power right now. 
Um, nuclear power remains the backbone of our emissions-free generation. Um, it's, it's the leading source of, uh, of round-the-clock baseload generation. Um, I don't think those policies were intended to harm nuclear, but that, exactly. is, that is what happened. And, and as you point out, quite often that does happen, and with, with all the best of intentions. Um, at the same time, if we put in policies that, that – or if we allow policies that, that harm our, our economy – isn't that going to hurt businesses' ability to, to address and to make investments to fight climate change? Absolutely. I mean, having private conversations with many of my members, especially in the, in the generation sector, um, they've all made significant commitments to emissions reductions over the next 30, 40, 50 years. But they're concerned that specific policies might deny them the capital they need to invest in the technologies they would need to actually meet those commitments. Absolutely. And, and let me reach just a little further. We've, we've established the fact that China is accounting for 30 percent of all the emissions in the world, and the United States only 15 percent. But um, even with China and, and, and their international emissions and, and what they are, are putting into the environment, uh, does the business community have a role in working with China, do you think, in, in trying to reduce emissions? Uh, absolutely. It's a great economic opportunity. I mean, the reality is, is that emissions from developing countries, and whether you consider China one or not, um, are going to continue to rise. And unless we or someone else uh, bring the technologies to bear that are scalable to the extent that we're talking about globally, we're not talking about a single state or a single community in this country where resources are relatively um, accessible. We're talking about scalable globally. Right. Um, they're gonna keep burning coal. So That's unless right. we have a way to capture the emissions from that, we're, at, we're gonna continue to be at a net negative as right. far as reductions. Well, again, thank you all for being here and thank you, Mr. Guth. And, and again, I can't stress as I have in the past that the opportunity that lies here, we have the brightest minds, the greatest innovators right here in America. That's why I'm so excited about this. I mean, people look at this, oh, uh, the, the, the sky's falling. Actually, this is one of the greatest opportunities I think we've had in this country in many, many years. And I look forward to seeing what, is, what results from this. So thank you very much and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Ms. Bonamici, you are recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you so much, Chair Castor, Ranking Member Graves, and thank you to our witnesses. We, we know what we're, we're facing. We have uh, are already seeing heat waves, droughts, uh, wildfires, a surge in extreme weather events, more acidic oceans, rising sea levels, and certainly the intergovernmental panel on climate change uh, emphasizes that it is time, it is past time to take bold action. And we do ha here in the United States have um, the ability and, and I submit the obligation as well to, to be a leader in curbing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, certainly um, our commitments under the Paris Climate Agreement is that's an important first step, but there's so much more that we can do and we must accept this challenge. Uh, we know it's going to require innovation, leadership, and the responsible use of our vast resources. I just had the opportunity to tour a uh, manufacturer of a wave buoy that's going to help tap the power of the ocean. So, Mr. Harvey, in your testimony, you highlight the examples of advances in clean energy technology, uh, wind, solar, battery storage, um, and uh, significant federal investments in research and development have been critical in developing and deploying new and advanced clean energy technologies, programs like ARPA-E, uh, supporting high-risk, high-reward energy research that's not being addressed by the private sector. So I'm going to ask Mr. Harvey and Mr. Foster, what sectors would benefit from uh, additional R&D resources, and in what other areas would additional federal funds be effective in spurring innovation and research? So thank you for the, for the question. I think it's a, a very important one. Everybody on this panel, I think everybody in this room agrees technology is a key to success here. Um, right now, the United States of America spends less than one half of 1% 1 of its energy budget on R&D. That's pitiful. It's the wrong number. For IT, it's 10%. For pharmaceuticals, it's 20%. More than 10 years ago, I founded something called the American Energy Innovation Council, which was uh, about 10 CEOs, including Bill Gates, uh, the CEOs of GE, McDonnell Douglas, a number of other com companies. We urged a trebling of federal R&D. Um, I think if you treble clean energy R&D from roughly 2.5 billion to 7.5 billion, you would create an amazing down payment on the future. 
That said, there's development of new ideas and then there's deployment. And innovation happens all the way along that. You need a different policy for innovation in the deployment phase. You need large-scale purchase. And in the beginning, you're going to pay a little more. But over time, you drive the price down. So you're creating options for all of humanity. We've done that successfully with solar, with wind, with many aspects of geothermal, with fracking, with many other technologies. The learning curve, as it's called in scientific parlance, is our friend. But if you let technologies die on the vine before you get to those price reductions, then you fail to create those options for future generations. I appreciate that very much. I also serve on the Science, Space, and Technology Committee, so it's very helpful. Um, uh, Mr. Foster, climate change we know is affecting our entire, entire economy and solution must include the creation of good paying jobs. My other committee is the Education and Labor Committee, where we do work on a lot of workforce issues advocated for on-the-job training programs. Um, and I know, Mr. Harvey, you mentioned um, people who work in coal power plants. My, my grandfather was a coal miner in Pennsylvania. I'm sure he worked very hard in that coal mine trying to support his family. He lost his leg and then he died of lung cancer. So he had severe health problems. So we want to have good, safe jobs for workers, and that needs to be central to a clean energy economy. So um, Mr. Foster, you, you talk about the workforce development crisis across all energy technologies, especially in energy efficiency, and high, you highlight um, energy efficiency jobs paying substantially more than equivalent occupations outside of the energy field. So how can Congress better support workforce development in the energy sector in our transition to a clean energy economy, Mr. Foster? Well, first let me just add that, uh, in my opinion, there's no technology more important to invest in right now than carbon capture sequestration, simply because we have no other paths to decarbonization in the industrial sector, and it's extremely important that we contribute to that. <laughs> it also has other applications that, from a political point of view, I think open up uh, the subject of climate change to a much broader discussion in this country because it then talks about what is the future of coal, what are the future of fossil fuels. If we have that technology, it becomes very, very important to uh, otherwise abandoned communities. In terms of what can be done on the energy workforce uh, crisis, uh, I think a deep look at how our federal agencies collaborate and coordinate on how they develop curriculum that supports energy efficiency technologies, uh, how the National Science Foundation, how the Department of Education, uh, how the Department of Defense, Department of Labor, uh, and the Department of Energy all work on how they uh, create a uniform standard-driven energy efficiency technology that can be spread out around the country to our benefit. That was a project we worked on when I was at the Department of Energy, and I think it's something of extreme importance to solve this crisis. Thank you. Very helpful. I yield back. Thank you very much. Mrs. Miller, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank all of you for being here today. We all care about taking care of and protecting Mother Earth in the past century, we have seen unparalleled economic growth around the world. This boom is in part because people have access to energy, increased access to affordable electricity to power our homes, our schools, and our places of work correlates directly to the improved quality of life for people all around the world. Any recommendation this committee makes must ensure that we maintain access to affordable energy. Dismantling coal, oil, and natural gas will not only hurt our economy, but it will also make energy less affordable and set society back. I can personally attest to the effect of policy that can decimate an economy. One of the many aspects that makes our country great is our entrepreneurial spirit. So many of our nation's small businesses and corporations have taken steps to be good stewards of the environment and to give back to their communities without the direction of the federal government because it is the right thing to do. It is a good reminder of what can be done when the government takes a back seat and lets businesses run themselves. Mr. Guth, in your experience with the private sector, what is already being done to lower carbon emissions while preserving and promoting our nation's diverse energy mix? Um, where do I begin? Uh, if you look across the many commitments that have been made, 
I mean, some of them have been um, within the, 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 the companies themselves. Uh, there's been billions of dollars invested in, in greater efficiencies within the manufacturing sector. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the advent of the shale revolution and what that's meant to uh, fuel diversity um, and efficiency and, and frankly, emissions. Uh, but ultimately, as you, you pointed out, we've seen great economic growth over the last century. If you look over just the last 40 years, we've seen our own economy grow by about 170% while simultaneously reducing the criteria air pollutants by 70%. That was driven by innovation, that was driven by science, and that was driven by uh, the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial and uh, ingenuity of the business community. What technologies can and should be deployed to mitigate carbon? Uh, I think there's a, a pretty wide consensus across every scientific body that's looked at this, um, that the three core technologies that are essential from a scalability um, standpoint globally are carbon capture, sequestration, um, whether it's utilization or otherwise, um, uh, stationary storage, uh, renewables have made a huge dent in uh, our uh, emissions profile, but until we can bring them to a uh, parity as far as um, base load replacement, um, they're going to have a glass ceiling. And then finally, advanced nuclear. I mean, every uh, body that, I, that I've looked at that has looked at this all say that those are the three. Um, and obviously, efficiency is going to continue to be um, integral to all of them. In 2017, the United States led the world in the reduction of climate emissions. However, other countries, even those who are signatories to multilateral agreements, are canceling out our efforts. Can you speak to how we can, in America, do uh, and help to counteract what these other countries are doing? Um, as I mentioned in my testimony, the developing, developing world uh, is projected to continue to have emissions increases, while the developed world is projected to continue to decrease them. Um, unfortunately, they're not equal, and we, look, we expect uh, emissions to continue to increase globally on the net. Um, what can be done is, is what we're, we're doing now, and that's investing in the technology um, to a much greater scale um, we've consistently been disappointed with, with OMB's budget um, when it comes to innovation and technology. Um, we agree that there is a lot more that needs to be done at the federal level, um, both from a, uh, an RD&D standpoint, but also from a commercialization standpoint, um, as well as structurally within the federal government itself to focus on these core technologies. But right now, U.S. business continues to lead the way. Thank you. I yield back my time. Thank you very much. Mr. Huffman, you are recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks to our witnesses. Uh, I'm intrigued uh, and a little bit skeptical uh, about this notion of carbon capture and sequestration that we keep coming back to, and, and several of the witnesses have referenced it. Mr. Foster, I can, I can stipulate that if, if we've got a natural gas power plant that comes online and is truly zero emission because it has implemented uh, cutting-edge carbon capture and sequestration, that, that would be a good thing. Uh, and my understanding is that plant is not yet producing electricity, and my concern is that this notion of, uh, of CCS has always been that thing just around the corner that we keep pointing to to avoid bolder action in support of clean renewables and efficiency and other things. But I, I want to, um, for a moment, uh, imagine that this really uh, is near and, and uh, deployable at scale. And I guess my question for you is, is I get that uh, that's appealing to folks that want to minimize disruption to fossil fuel infrastructure and to fossil fuel interests, but why would anyone do it in the absence of regulations, in the absence of some cap on emissions, in the absence of some price on carbon? It's not going to happen out of the goodness of people's heart. Would you agree with me? Uh, I would agree with that. I think uh, from, the, from the studies that uh, we did when I was at DOE, it was a combination of baseline uh, policy uh, combined with forward-leaning tax credit. And those things have generally been the combination in uh, driving climate uh, policy forward that I've been uh, the most struck by. So that, for instance, the clean power plan uh, coupled with uh, the ITC and, and PTC taxes for uh, wind and um, solar along with the new technologies of hydraulic fracking, lowering the cost of natural gas, 
Uh, very quickly, uh, according to the National Renewable Energy Lab, within uh, less than a year after the adoption of the Clean Power Plan, market forces had taken over and were driving uh, the reduction of CO2 emissions faster than policy alone. So I think that combination of things is, is really the magic spot. All right. Uh, Mr. Harvey, uh, I, I think I'm hearing you say that if we take our thumb off the scale for fossil fuels uh, and put in place some of the incentives like the one Mr. Foster and I were just talking about, either carbon pricing or some caps that begin to move the market towards low emission uh, solutions, uh, that clean energy competes just fine and in some cases actually saves money. Would you elaborate on that, please? Yes, absolutely. Um, there is a problem with unintended consequences of regulation, and that's been raised already, and we need to pay attention to that. In my mind, the best way to achieve reductions is to think about public standards. We have public standards so that our meat isn't poisoned, so that our water is clean. You mentioned the Clean Air Act. Um, fantastic, fantastic unleashing of technology and business innovation, but be it came about because of public standards, because we said we're going to emit fewer carcinogens and fewer lung-damaging particulates into the atmosphere. That's what we need in carbon dioxide as well, is set clear public standards and let the market find the best way to achieve them. Don't choose technology. Don't choose prices. That's a communist idea. Mm -hmm. Choose what the public needs and let the market do its job. Can you give us an example of the standards that might be set? For example, there's lots sure. of talk about net zero emissions by 2050. Is that the kind of standard that you could build incentives around? It is, um, although I wouldn't argue for that one precisely. Um, there are 30 states now with renewable portfolio standards. The best of them say, hit the target, go. I don't care how you do it. And by the way, I would make it clean energy. I wouldn't make it renewable energy per se. Understood. Technology um, neutral. Technology neutral. Absolutely. Um, those, uh, every one of those, every single one of those has been hit at a lower cost than projected, and some of them at dramatically lower costs. And by the way, they're not R things or D things. They're both sides of the aisle, these renewable portfolio okay. standards. So for the country, I, I mentioned 80% by 2035. It's feasible. Um, it would set a clear signal. It creates enough of a time horizon that businesses can get to it. Uh, it would be very powerful. All right, thanks. I don't have a lot of time, but Mr. Guth, um, I am drawn to the fact that you're saying inaction is not an option. And believe me, I, I'm encouraged by that statement as far as it goes. But my challenge is I'm looking at uh, a couple of decades of action by the chamber uh, here in Congress and elsewhere that is all about preventing action on addressing climate change. In 2007, you spearheaded the defeat of a very modest climate bill, uh, Lieberman Warner. Uh, you spearheaded the opposition to Waxman Markey. You turned around, you targeted members of Congress that voted uh, for that climate solution in, in the, the next election. You defeated them. And when your allies came into power, they have done nothing for a decade on this issue, and, and you were just fine with that. Um, I guess what I'm trying to understand, oh, and, and you also funded studies that attacked the Paris Climate Agreement, and Donald Trump cited those studies, even though they've been debunked by independent scientists. So uh, it, after all of this effort you've put in to defending the status quo and preventing climate action, uh, as, you, as you testify today telling us that inaction is not an option, has there been a change in the chamber's position? Um, no. I mean, the, the chamber... Well, that's, that's really what the, I was the, uh, asking. And so reserving my time, reclaiming my time, I, I want to urge you to the talk... The gentleman's about, time has expired, and I think we'll be able to get back to yeah, that. Yeah, I'll look that forward issue. to that. So at this point, we will uh, recognize Mr. Griffith for five minutes. Mr. Armstrong will be recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you. Um, and so I take a little exception with the talk that carbon capture isn't uh, feasible. We're doing two, pro I mean, we're dealing with whether it's alum cycle research. Uh, we have a thing called Project Tundra in North Dakota where we're doing for, um, we have a great partnership before, between the coal industry, the wind industry, the oil and gas industry, and utilizing it because we have, so it's North Dakota, but we have some advantages of geography in that they're both there, not to mention Weyburn up in the Weyburn field in Canada has been doing this now for over a decade. Um, so as we continue to work forward with that, I, I, Americans want clean air, they want clean water. And sometimes I think we get into a situation where our policies get counterintuitive based on politics. And I, I don't think there's a better answer than that than pipelines. Uh, 
transportation is obviously the, one of the lead drivers in carbon emissions. It's whether it's trains, whether it's cars, whether it's anything, it's not as safe to move product on rail or on the roads as it is in pipelines. But more importantly, as we're trying to move like natural gas through, it'd be nice to get a quorum on FERC. That would be pretty good moving forward. But we try and move our, I mean, moving our gas to the East Coast, we end up having a really bad winter. Carbon emissions actually go up because state water law is trumping FERC siting on a pipeline, and so we're using heating oil instead of natural gas to burn. And I think we do this a lot. We do. Perfect is the enemy of good when we continue to have this conversation. So, um, and just... So with the Bakken Shale Revolution in North Dakota, we've invested $12 billion in gas infrastructure. We probably need another five or six billion more. So as we continue to capture carbon from uh, like North American coal or the Wolf Creek Station, all that's gonna do without the infrastructure is, I mean, it's still better. We're capturing the carbon, but we're producing more oil and gas and we don't have the infrastructure in place to process the gas. And then we run into these kind of uh, issues. So I guess my, Question for uh, Mr. Foster, you were the one who talked about carbon capture. What or what incentives, what advantages can we do so, and I agree with you, it's clean energy, so we can do this in a realistic manner that is allowing industries to compete and also protect the reliability of the grid. I mean, that's, that's a part of the conversation I don't think we have enough, is that, I mean, given certain stor storage limitations, and weather limitations, if you live in a state like mine where it's 35 below for 45 days in a row and windmills don't turn if it's more than 20 below, we have to have reliable energy. And the one thing you can't do with a coal plant is turn it on and off very quickly. Now, there's some quick combustion engines with natural gas, and we can do those things. So how do we really truly incentivize? I mean, we do some stuff with our research arm at the EERC and do a lot of projects. But from a federal level, how do we not pick winners and losers and just start talking about whether it's sequestration, enhanced oil recovery, and those types of things? I, I believe that a properly constructed federal clean energy standard coupled with improvements to the 45Q tax credit uh, would provide the kind of uh, architecture uh, to help make carbon capture sequestration uh, more commercially viable in the electric sector. But beyond that, uh, I think it's absolutely critical that we drive the cost of deployment of that technology down so that it can be uh, usable in industrial applications because we have no other way to remove emissions from uh, blast furnaces and steel mills or from cement kilns or a host of other uh, industrial applications that are going to be needed the world over. And so what better economic driver than to be the leaders in producing, applying, commercializing this technology across all its different uses? And just so to understand how this works on the ground sometimes, I mean, innovation happens in really interesting places. So we have a ethanol plant that is immediately located next to a coal plant, and they use the coal plant to heat the ethanol plant. So they're capturing, they're increasing efficiencies, they're driving down the cost instead of a waste product. Now they're creating two different things. And then I just guess I'll have a question for Mr. Guth. How do we do any of these things that doesn't just export our pollution? I mean, in, unless we're going to if we're going to go back and ban the export of oil, ban the export of LNG, ban the export of coal when we're dealing with developing countries and doing those things, I mean, isn't if we're serious about this conversation, isn't the conversation also have to include the, that part of the conversation cuz the last thing we want to do is export our pollution to countries that don't have the regulations we have here. It's not just on the upstream side, it's on the, the, the consumption side, too. I mean, we know full well that, that climate change is a global issue. And if it's not addressed globally, it's not going to be addressed. If we don't have technologies in place that the rest of the world can use, whether it be sequestration or otherwise, then we're going to continue to see emissions rise. And I would also point out to follow up on, on Mr. Foster's answer, right now the Use It Act is an incredibly important regulatory change that has tremendous bipartisan support in the Senate, and hopefully we'll see it pass there and come over here to help facilitate greater use of, um, of sequestration. Thank you very much. Mr. Levin, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Castor, and thank you to our witnesses for providing such thorough testimony. Many of your statements make it clear that the planet is heading towards huge costs associated with climate change. However, it's heartening to see you've done a lot of work to chart the best path forward that can help the United States and the rest of the world to avoid those costs. 
Uh, Dr. Liverman, I'd like to begin with you and also begin by saying my wife is a proud University of Arizona graduate. She'd be very mad if I didn't offer bear down. Um, in this committee, we've discussed uh, that there will be a significant financial cost uh, if nations, including the United States, don't take action on climate change. So I would offer that any recommendations the committee makes must be compared to that baseline. Uh, in your testimony, I was struck uh, when you said that limiting warming to one and a half degrees Celsius rather than two degrees could avoid up to $38 trillion, that's with a T, $38 trillion worldwide in damages by the end of the century. On this figure, can you estimate how many dollars of those damages might take place in the United States? The IPCC didn't look at that, but the US National Climate Assessment did provide some figures. Um, they suggested that um, if uh, warming continues, that damages could be up to 0.6% um, higher if we go to two degrees um, in the US. And that would be 2.3% of GDP per degree of warming. So if we continue to warm, if we don't act, it will have a significant impact on our GDP. So it would be terrific if you could track down the number in trillions of dollars in direct economic impact, the cost of inaction in the United States, and provide that to, to the committee. I would be happy to do so. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Harvey, uh, in fairness to my wife, I noticed you went to my alma mater, Stanford University, so go Cardinal. Uh, I was interested to uh, read uh, your finding that multiple Midwestern states that derive more than 25% of their generation from wind power have more reliable grids than their neighbors that don't. Uh, this week, you're probably aware the House is voting on a bill that would keep the U.S. in the Paris Agreement. Uh, and I've offered an amendment to that bill underscoring the fact that cleaner and more reliable forms of energy like wind uh, don't necessarily mean less reliability or higher costs. In fact, often the opposite is true. Uh, could you elaborate on how uh, wind power and other renewables uh, integrated into the grid of the future don't necessarily equate to higher costs or less reliability? Certainly, Congressman Levin, and thanks for the opportunity. I studied power systems planning in my graduate program in engineering at Stanford, and we were taught to turn on power plants in ascending economic dispatch order uh, to meet whatever the demand was. And that people still refer to baseload power, shouldering power, and peaking power. That paradigm is giving way to a new management strategy, which is system optimization. So a grid operator should have a whole suite of resources at his or her fingertips, ranging from the conventional power plants to renewable energy to demand side opportunities as well, and then wheeling power across large distances. The more options you have, the more robust your system is. If something goes down and you have a good transmission line, you can bring in electricity from another part of the country. When it's freezing cold in North Dakota, it's probably reasonably warm in Arizona. Um, when San Diego has a peak demand, Seattle doesn't, and vice versa. So by hooking together heterogeneous systems and heterogeneous power supply and optimizing across the suite, you create a much more robust system and a much more reliable system. It's, it's what other industries are used to doing. The electric power industry is just learning to do that. And I'll, I'll just mention one last word. The head of the California Independent System Operator, Stephen Berberick, is somebody you should consider as a witness because he's running one of the largest grids and the fifth largest economy in the world world, and he's pushing into these frontiers, and he's not breaking a sweat. I think a field trip to Folsom would be great for the committee to see Kaiso. Uh, Mr. Guth, I noted your mention of a San Diego Gas and Electric uh, project, uh, and I commend the work of sdg &E. That's in my neck of the woods, but I'd note that it didn't happen in a vacuum. It happened only after tough uh, regulatory oversight by the California Public Utilities Commission. Uh, I wanted to turn to the Paris Accord uh, and get your take on it for just a minute. I noticed uh, the Chamber has a position saying, and I quote, uh, the Chamber believes that an effective climate policy should encourage international cooperation, uh, end quote, and also, quote, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate, Ch climate Change's Paris Agreement uh, establish a comprehensive framework for international action, end quote. Uh, Mr. Guth, do you believe the United States should stay in the Paris Climate Agreement? I think that the business community has been, um, has been pretty clear that the United States needs to remain at the table internationally, um, and that, that includes the, the Paris Agreement itself. Great. I agree, and every member will have the opportunity to vote this week to keep the United States in the Paris Agreement when H.R. 9 comes to the floor. If I, if I may, though, the, the, the legislation is not just about Paris. It's also about the, the commitment and how by we get there. Um, then that's a completely separate issue. 
Well, I find any uh, discussion of H.R. 9 or questioning of H.R. 9 hard to reconcile with the Chamber's position. I actually think it's quite consistent, and I think my colleagues across the aisle will agree if they take the time to read the legislation. I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Levin. Uh, Mr. Griffith, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I have to respond. I've read the legislation, and I'm not voting for it. Uh, so there. All right. Uh, Mr. Foster, thank you so much for being here today, and thank you. You're probably the only person on the panel today who's actually been to my uh, district, and uh, it was one of those rare moments when, while we didn't agree on everything, Secretary Moniz sent you and a team down to see what was going on in the coal fields. I greatly appreciated that. We had a seminar, as you'll recall, at the University of Wise, uh, University of Virginia at Wise, and then you all went over to a high school in one of my poorest counties, Dickinson County. My district, for those who don't know, butts uh, West Virginia, Kentucky, North Carolina, and Tennessee, and we have a significant uh, coal mining uh, investment in part of the district. It's a large, very large district. And so I was very appreciative of your comments on page four of your written testimony that says we need to, first we need to embrace an all of the above flexible strategy toward climate solutions. There is no silver bullet. You said this in your oral, oral testimony too. No single technology, no one perfect policy, which is why I believe we have to continue to invest in uh, research. Uh, I would suggest when you, and you appreciated you both pronouncing Appalachia for those of us from central Appalachia correctly and uh, for recognizing there are some things we can do in Appalachia. One that wasn't on your list because we hadn't uh, really thought about it when you all were down to visit is closed loop storage inside of a coal mine uh, using the, the water. That obviously, there's nothing living down there. We bring the water in from outside. There's not an environmental consequence, and we can use that as a giant battery uh, sitting in the same areas. Mr. Harvey said we want to put some of these jobs in the areas where the jobs are going to be lost, and my district has suffered heavily. Further, I would also have to say that um, one of the things we talked about at that seminar was the fact that we're going to continue to use coal. And everybody today has been talking about the, the grid and electricity. A large amount of the coal out of my district uh, makes steel. And I know you have a lot of uh, interest in steel as well, having worked with uh, the unions in that industry. And so we're going to continue to mine that high-quality coal. And uh, we have to find ways to make sure that the American public understands that not, not every coal is equal to other coal that a lot of the coal around the world is dirtier than our coal. Uh, and we have to come up with new research and ways to do that. Now, I'm excited and will tell you that one of the participants there, and you, you heard the uh, testimony from Dr. Yoon at uh, Virginia Tech, they've just taken some of their technology, and they were looking at rare earth minerals and separating that from the carbon in central Appalachia, but they also can make poor coal better. And so they've licensed that technology to steel plants in India, and I think this is how we solve some of these problems so that they can take that poorer coal that they're mining in India and upgrade what they're doing, because they're going to make steel. Other nations, particularly in the developing world, are not going to impoverish their people because we've decided we don't want it to be warmer. No matter what the consequences may be, they're not going to have their people living in the dark or living in poverty. But if we can get technologies that we can then license what these two steel mills that, that they've licensed their technology to are going to do is lower the carbon footprint, because even in the developing world, they want to have jobs, they don't want to be impoverished, but they also want clean water and clean air. So this is where I think we can find the win, and I appreciate you saying that. And I am concerned, and we'll give you an opportunity to, to give me some help, that the DOE's loan program uh, that you worked with uh, and that you said in your testimony there was $39 billion of unused low-interest loan and loan guarantees authority that could move rapidly to help finance some of this research that I'm very positive about. Tell me, why aren't we using that? What can we do to speed that up? Um, well, I submitted along with my uh, testimony a uh, research paper that had been done by the Energy Futures Initiative about a year ago on a whole range of suggestions on how the loan program office could be applied, particularly to energy infrastructure investments um, and a variety of other uh, issues like that. I do think that the uh, with the budget constraints that uh, Congress may have on it, this is authorized uh, $39 billion uh, worth of, of uh, loan guarantees and low interest loans that could be applied without further authorizations. Uh, so I think uh, looking deeply at ways in which the loan program office could be used to accelerate additional technologies, particularly energy infrastructure, uh, look at the research paper we did, and we strongly right. encourage uh, the committee we'll to investigate that more. I appreciate it. Mr. Guth, 
uh, you heard my spiel on developing countries. What can we do to increase uh, their use of technologies because they're going to continue to use fossil fuels? Uh, we know that. In fact, World Bank said we're not going to lend any more money for building coal-fired power plants, so China is investing in them all over the world, particularly in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, uh, in building new coal-fired power plants that we want. What can we do to encourage these countries to use the new technologies and to make it cleaner? That's a great example right there. I mean, the technology that the Chinese are financing is subcritical, and so you have more emissions. If the U.S. would have subcritical means poor. Yes. Yeah. If you would have remained, if the United States would have remained as part of that uh, financing mechanism, we would have been using um, ultracritical technology and therefore lower emissions. But ultimately, we need to develop and commercialize the technology. If we make it available, as we have so many technologies that we're using right now, the rest of the world will use it. But the rest of the world generally, especially in the developing world, does not have the resources that we have. Thank you very much. Mr. Kasten, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Castor. Thank you so much to the panel. Um, I want to focus my comments really on, or questions really on economics, and just want to start with something that is, I think, non-controversial but too rarely said, and that is that fossil fuel is an inherently high marginal cost source of energy relative to every other option. And when you use less fossil fuel, you reduce less CO2 and you save money. Um, it's not complicated, but we don't mention it often enough. The one exception, of course, is in the extractive industries. And the jobs in the extractive industries have a rooting interest in higher cost energy. The entire rest of the economy, from steel production to Bitcoin mining to airline pl flight attendants, has a vested interest in lower cost energy. Mr. Foster, can you give me a rough estimate of how many jobs have a rooting interest in higher cost energy in the country relative to the numbers that have a rooting interest in lower cost energy? The rough numbers of a number of them according to the U.S. Energy and Employment Report. So for the uh, coal industry, which includes their entire value chain, it would be about 200,000 jobs. For the natural gas industry, it would be about 650,000. And for the petroleum industry, it would be about 900,000. Uh, so if you try to put that in comparison, uh, I mentioned wind and solar. Uh, solar, if you're looking at the majority time jobs, it's about 240,000. Wind, it's about 107,000. Uh, you look at uh, the other uh, zero carbon energy, I think I mentioned nuclear is in the range of 63,000, hydro 66,000. Uh, is it safe to say that even those pale beside those industries like, like steel making, all the manufacturing sector that actually you know, employs the bulk of the economy? that has a rooting interest in lower cost energy? Well, I think, I think just about every sector of the, of the economy has an interest in lower cost energy. And one of the things I found interesting is following how, you know, in the era of really unparalleled uh, growth in the United States, we have seen a constantly diminishing uh, share of gross domestic product going to energy. So it's down to about 5.4% today of, gross, of overall gross domestic product. So, I so just, and I'm, and I'm sorry, thing. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, but I know we're tight on time. Is it, is it safe to say that investing in lower marginal cost energy sources is a net job creator and is net stimulative to the economy? That's a, a very big generalization that I wouldn't necessarily jump to. Uh, okay, I certainly would, but fair enough. The um, a, a part of the reason I say this is because I spent 20 years in the energy industry before I got here, mm -hmm. and I am of the opinion that the single biggest explanation for the fall in CO2 emissions in the electric sector was the 1992 Energy Policy Act and FERC Order 888, which for the first time encouraged us to preferentially deploy lower cost assets, which, oh, by the way, are the more efficient, less fossil fuel intensive assets. I was delighted to hear your comments on that, Mr. Harvey, and I wonder if you'd chat a little bit about what more we might be thinking at, specifically at the FERC level, to better incentivize lower cost production and to better value ancillary services like voltage stability and other mechanisms to accelerate this transition to cheaper and cleaner energy. Representative Kasson, you've just proved yourself to be an energy nerd, so congratulations. <laughs> <coughs> I never thought Not I'd the hear ancillary <laughs> services. So um, the FERC has a very important job to do now. Uh, wholesale markets in America are FERC regulated, but they're not generally FERC controlled. They're controlled by independent nonprofit associations that are answerable to no one. Um, and that's a bit of a problem. Uh, what's 
what happens is, is um, and you're absolutely correct with the Rule 888, <clears throat> it opens the doors for lowest marginal cost uh, energy dispatch. Um, however, uh, the FERC and other independent markets have the ability to set conditions for those sales and the ability to re reward other attributes, so spinning reserve, ancillary services, capacity factors, and so forth. Some of those things you need to reward, others of those are basically fake ways to give a lot of money to certain industries. And I'm, I'm being blunt here because one needs to be. That's exactly what's going on right now. The proper answer is to define those characteristics based on physical and economic need, not based on arbitrary made up numbers. Um, and the, I think the FERC just needs a stronger instruction about what its role is in creating a, a truly fluid market, a truly liquid market. Um, so with the little time I have left, and I, I really, really enjoyed your testimony, I want to introduce for the record, with unanimous consent if I could, the Climate Policy Initiative Report, Supporting Renewables While Saving Taxpayer Money. Um, Madam Chair, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to enter this into the record. The, there specifically is a, a rich discussion in here about the benefits of using cash incentives as opposed to tax credits, which you talked about. Can, can you give us a little bit of an education on the differential ways that, that cash incentives versus tax incentives drive investments in clean energy? Certainly. So whenever you give somebody cash, they get a dollar's worth of benefit for every dollar you give them. If you give them a tax credit, they have to find a way to use that tax credit. And most startups and most new technology companies don't have profits or don't have excess profits, so they don't need the tax credit. So they sell it on a secondary market. The price of that tax credit is always going to be less than a dollar because of transaction costs. In many cases, because of restrictions on the tax credit, it's as low as 50 cents, which means the federal government is getting 50 cents for every dollar it gives up. That's a terrible bargain. So the answer is either direct grants or highly fungible, highly liquid tax credits. That, thank Good. you. I wish I had more time, but I think I'm out. And we will ask Mr. Harvey to get back to the committee with greater detail on that point. At this time, I recognize the ranking member. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Dr. Libman, thanks again for being here. Um, you, you made reference to IPCC and Paris or Accord earlier. Um, do, do you believe that the metric measuring uh, China and India's uh, emissions is the appropriate one, meaning including a, a GDP or an economic unit as opposed to an absolute reduction? I think we need to use all of the measures to assess what's happening in China, whether it be their absolute emissions, their historic emissions, their carbon intensity, and most scientists will look at all of those. So, so, so just doing economic is not an appropriate metric? I think the research suggests that we should look at multiple metrics because each metric gives us a different insight into what China's doing and where it's going. Thank you. Uh, number two, I, I want to make sure I understood what you said before, so please correct my statement if I, if I get this wrong. But you made mention of the greenhouse gas concentrations in the environment and talked about how much of that is attributable to what we released over the last 50 years. And so I, I want to take it a step further and make sure I've got this right. So, so there is sort of a momentum within, within the, the environment uh, of these greenhouse gases. And so the, effectively, it, it, we could stop all emissions today in the United States, and those concentrations that are there are there. And, and so the uh, temp corresponding temperature changes would, would, would result uh, as a re uh, because of those greenhouse gas concentrations that are in the environment from previous emissions. Is that accurate? Um, yes, unless, of course, we look at what IPCC calls the negative emissions. And the discussion that we've had so far has focused very much on the technology of carbon capture and storage, um, the sort of new technology, but we have a very long-standing technology of carbon capture and storage, which is forestry Bio and farming for yeah. carbon capture. Biogenic, yeah. Right. And sure, so sure. Um, that we could... Uh, make a dent in the emissions that are already there, and the U.S. can play a major role if we manage our forests and manage our farmland in order to capture carbon. I read, a, I, I read an interesting article this week, I think it was the Sulk Institute, on how they're working on plant technology in order to increase the sink that results. In fact, I, I used to 
uh, work on coastal resiliency issues. We, we were looking at how to change the vegetation in some of our diversion, water diversion receiving areas to increase the uptake of phosphates and nitrates to help reduce the, uh, the, the dead zone that was occurring, the hypoxic conditions in the Gulf of Mexico. And so I, I agree there are other uh, technologies and I think some of the extraction or carbon capture storage, carbon capture utilization are important ones. Um, do, do, you, do you believe that we should be using a metric of looking at sort of best return on investment whenever we, we make recommendations ultimately out of this committee looking at which, which recommendations are going to get best return on investment in terms of, of, of preventing temperature increases and preventing sea rise and things along those lines? Yes, we need a metric of return on investment. But I would say that IPCC and many other scientific assessments do identify the challenge of putting a financial cost on some losses, loss of life, loss of farms, sure. loss of infrastructure. It can be quite hard to put a dollar value on that mm -hmm. and also the uncertainty about discounting the future. But, so, but, but it is important for us to use some type of metric looking at jobs and economic and return on investment and others in, yes. in the recommendation. Yeah, thank yes. you. Um, uh, moving on, uh, Mr. Harvey, I want to uh, you, you talked a lot about renewables. You talked about wind and solar and others, and certainly uh, th those are important. All of the above uh, strategies or components of, of, a, of a comprehensive strategy. Um, but, but you didn't talk about uh, storage. And, and obviously that's an important part, that sun doesn't shine at night, right? Um, and so I was looking at some statistics the Manhattan Institute put together. Uh, they determined that the, the Gigafactory, Tesla's Gigafactory, the largest battery manufacturing facility in the world, that, it, that its annual production is capable of storing three minutes of, of U.S. energy. If they produced batteries for a thousand years, we would be able to uh, store enough energy for two days in the United States. Um, uh, 50 to 100 pounds of rare earth materials are mined for every one pound of battery. Uh, how, do you, how do you reconcile that and the environmental impacts? And let's keep in mind, uh, 15 of the top 23 uh, commodities we're importing, minerals we're importing, including rare earth, are, are actually um, China, Russia, and other countries like that, or no, China and Russia alone, are involved in, 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 in providing those materials to the United States. So electricity storage and batteries is really expensive. And it's true, we're not going to get to long-term grid scale battery storage at a cost-effective number anytime soon. Fortunately, we don't need to. There are half a dozen strategies to balance the grid given variable renewables. I mentioned wheeling power. Uh, is the, the grid is a, is a kind of battery because we never need the same, have the same demands across the United States, nor the same supplies. We need to use some of our other resources better. The Bonneville Power Administration uses its hydroelectricity for bulk power instead of peaking power. That's economically insane, right? We should use it at its highest value use. Onshore wind has a different operating regime than offshore wind. Um, offshore wind operates much longer and for different times. So the more, the more varieties you have and the more they're hooked together, the less you need battery storage. Um, all that said, I'm, I, I think storage is one realm where we need to do a lot of R&D, and we can use spot storage to alleviate tensions and problems on the grid. But your main point about bulk storage is, is correct. Yes. Uh, Madam, Chair, uh, Madam Chair, I want to ask unanimous consent uh, to include in the record a, a graphic from the Manhattan Institute that indicates that $1 million invested in shale and a $1 million invested in solar and wind would actually produce uh, at least six times as much energy uh, over a 30-year period as compared to, again, wind or, or solar. Uh, yield back. Any objection? And I failed to rule on Mr. Kasten's uh, unit, unanimous uh, consent request. So if without objection, we will admit into the record Mr. Kasten's material and the ranking member's material. Uh, at this time, Mr. DeGoose, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Castor, and thank you for holding this important hearing. Thank you to the witnesses. Uh, I reviewed uh, your testimony, your written testimony, as well as I know my colleagues have, and found it, uh, each of you in your respective testimonies, to be incredibly helpful and thoughtful uh, and certainly educational for us and our work, and so appreciate uh, the work that you have done. I would say, with respect to the, the ranking members' comments, uh, and I certainly appreciate them regarding energy storage, uh, begs perhaps a larger question that uh, for this committee and for this Congress to, to debate, which is to say, 
why not invest more resources in research on energy storage? And that seems to be an area uh, where there is some bipartisan support. And uh, I appreciated the Chamber of Commerce's uh, written testimony in terms of recommending increased investments on ARPA-E and so forth, which I imagine could be incredibly productive from an energy storage uh, standpoint. So I would hope that my colleagues would join us in that effort. Uh, I am a FERC nerd as well, and so like Mr. Armstrong and Mr. Kasten, I wanted to talk to you, Mr. Harvey, a little bit about your recommendations. Before I do so, I do just want to touch on a comment uh, made by Mr. Carter in the beginning of the hearing uh, with you, Mr. Uh, Guth. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. My name's a tough one. So, um, you know, I my understanding of Mr. Armstrong's comment was essentially that federal standards um, or international standards for that matter uh, from a renewable energy standpoint, uh, that those could have unintended consequences, that they could impede economic growth, and so that's why uh, perhaps some folks on the other side of the aisle oppose them and, and perhaps uh, your organization as well. Am I understanding that right, that exchange? Um, no, I made the point that you have policymakers have to be careful in how they develop policy because there could be especially as it relates to climate, far-reaching impacts. I mean, the, the example that we were discussing is um, focusing on one specific type of non-emitting non energy that might therefore have a negative impact on another non-emitting energy. Um, in that case, it was, it was nuclear. So uh, I appreciate your response. I, what I would say is it, part of why I'm struggling, and I suspect maybe my colleague Representative Huffman uh, feels the same way, is some of your written testimony seems to indicate uh, in fact, a preference for some of these standards, a, a good example of this is the Kigali Amendment, right? An amendment that's been ratified by 66 countries that uh, a variety of uh, business entities in our country uh, are advocating for passage of here, right? Because we know that there would be a substantial economic impact in terms of the tens of thousands of jobs that would be created by virtue of committing to the reduction, you know, 80% uh, over the next 30 years of HFCs, right? Uh, billions of dollars of economic impact here in the United States. And so I guess my the point that I am making is uh, that standards imposed at the federal level or by international agreement uh, can be uh, quite a boon to our economic growth. And I would hope that the chamber uh, would, uh, would appreciate that, given that you all have been very supportive of the Kigali Amendment. So. I, I think it's a great example where the business community was involved so that policymakers understood what was achievable versus what was... Um, hypothetical. And that's why I think you got to a point with Kigali where it was a win-win across the board. And that's why, I mean, to go back to Mr. Huffman's original question, I mean, the, the chamber hasn't changed. Certainly the business community has evolved, but we've been pushing for these types of advanced technology investments, certainly since I've been involved with the chamber a decade ago. I mean, without developing these technologies, if you go back 50 years, it well, was I, I don't want to sold. I appreciate your comments. I don't want to interrupt. Uh, I, I would say, in Representative Huffman's defense, while I certainly can't speak to uh, the Chamber's activities in the last uh, 10 years, and, and I'm new to Congress here for all, all told of 112 days, I suppose, uh, I think that the Chamber has had a long history uh, that has been well documented in terms of opposing a variety of different important legislative efforts uh, at the congressional level to try to move the needle in the fight against climate change. But as I said, appreciate your support to the Kigali Amendment and hope that uh, you can join uh, many of my colleagues here in the Congress that are urging the Trump administration to uh, to uh, to agree with uh, the vast majority of the international community that are pushing on that front. W Mr. Harvey, we, we have to voicefully. Thank you, <laughs> Mr. Harvey. Uh, with respect to FERC, just following up on the uh, point that Mr. Kasten made, I mean, I, your written testimony uh, articulates, I think, in an effective way, uh, the, the realities of the ways in which FERC has been uh, far from technology neutral. And I guess I am curious what recommendations you believe uh, we should take in terms of trying to give FERC that better, quote unquote, instruction that, I, that, that you can have referred to in your answer to Mr. Kasten. Well, I will, I will first acknowledge it's, it's difficult to specify a set of um, rules that are going to guide all future rulemaking. Um, but I do think uh, emphasizing again that it's the FERC's requirement to be technology neutral and set performance standards, that the performance standards should be based on an explicit physical or economic need not one that's made up. It might be worthwhile for the FERC to have a scientific or technical advisory board made up of utility engineers um, and national lab experts, something like that, to ascertain whether the decisions they made are made for a thumb on the scale reason or for system balancing and legitimate purpose. Um, but you do not want the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to be the handmaiden of a certain industry. It will wreck our electric system in the long run and it will impose unnecessary costs. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McEachin, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Let me start off by apologizing to you. We had a uh, hearing on robocalls in energy and commerce, and so <laughs> it was a bit repetitive, but there we were. So I apologize for my tardiness. Um, Mr. Foster and Mr. Harvey, I'm hopeful that the House of Representatives will consider infrastructure legislation in the next few months. To that end, um, Mr. Foster, your testimony has discussed the importance of investing in energy efficiency and infrastructure, both of which spur economic development. What would you prioritize for investments and why? Well, in terms of energy infrastructure, I think uh, almost any investment that you make is going to create uh, good high-paying jobs in the energy sector, the transmission distribution and storage system has almost three times the unionization rate of uh, any other part of the private sector. Uh, so you're dealing with highly skilled, uh, highly trained construction workers, uh, good paying jobs, so uh, rebuilding of transmission, expanding transmission to allow more renewables onto the grid, uh, a whole range of those kinds of activities will be uh, very good for the economy, lowering energy costs, and very good for job creation. So especially if you were to prioritize areas that had been negatively impacted by some of the changes that we've experienced in our evolving energy technologies, that would be a great place to start. And I'll just repeat again uh, that we have in the loan program office three, uh, $39 billion worth of unused loan authority that with the proper supervision could be used to jumpstart a big energy infrastructure spending program in America. Thank you for that. Mr. Harvey, what about you? What should, infrastructure, what should the infrastructure bill include to make a dent in our greenhouse gas pollution? One element I would propose is expanding transmission lines across the country to help balance renewables and balance the whole system. Um, and in fact, I think we should look at ways to streamline permitting. I, I advocate pre-zoning into red, yellow, and green zones where red, you're just not going to build anything. Uh, green, you get a permit in 90 days if you meet the proper specs. And yellow is like everything today, it's an all-out war. Um, so we just need to clean that up and save a lot of time and a lot of trouble. Um, I, would, I would recommend extending tax credits for uh, clean energy. There are a bunch of them are set to taper down starting now. Um, right when we're building momentum, that's the wrong time to, to, to do that. Um, so I would push those back another five years or something like that. I think also we need to look at transportation. Um, and one interesting opportunity would be to offer matching funds to utilities to build in electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Um, and then in general transportation infrastructure, one of, the, uh, one of the iron laws of transportation is if you build it, they will come. If you add freeway lanes, you get more cars. If you add things like bike paths, you get more bikes. There's a, there's a revolution in transportation options which we should take advantage of, what they call micro-mobility to, to bike share to autonomous vehicles or electric vehicles. We need to start, we need to, we've neglected our transportation infrastructure for decades now, and it's starting to fail us. Uh, and that's going to be very costly to the American economy. Let me uh, ask you as quickly as I can about your red, green, and yellow pre-zoning. Is that what you called it? Yes. Um, you know, we had, I experienced that problem in Virginia with local governments a particular area loses its, uh, its uh, coal industry, but when we try to put up a wind farm, they're concerned about their view shed. So it's, I understand some of the problems with zoning, but particularly in your red area, are you, are you, I mean in your um, green area, are you saying to those areas, no matter what their zoning laws are, we can come in and explain to me how that would work in a minute and three seconds. <laughs> <clears throat> the, the cognizant jurisdictions, be they local, state, or national, need to set whatever standards they want to set. Um, but then if in a green zone, a project meets those standards, it gets a permit in, in 90 days. All right, thank I you. I saved you 48 seconds. There we go. Madam Chair, we're going to give you 45 seconds back. Wow, that was fast. Very good. Uh, thank you, Mr. McEachin. Uh, Mr. Palmer, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, my question is for the entire panel. If, we, if the United States completely eliminated its carbon emissions, uh, would that stop global climate change? Well, if, if the question is, we, meaning the United States of America, if we did that, the answer is no, it clearly wouldn't. If the entire world stopped 
its carbon emissions, would that stop global climate change? Um, no, we have some built-in warming, but if we focused also on taking carbon out of the atmosphere, it could do so. Uh, have we ever seen a case where sea levels rose more than are predicted, for instance, by uh, the scientists now? Um, my understanding is that what we're observing is consistent with what the science has projected, but sea level rise does take a number of years, so much of that is still to come. Well, the reason I ask that is, is that we apparently, uh, some folks take as the gospel truth whatever these esteemed scientists project. And for instance, in his book, Farewell to Eyes, Peter Wat uh, Wadhams, who's a professor of ocean physics at Cambridge University, predicted that the polar ice in, in the Arctic, Arctic would be gone by mid-decade. Not only is the ice still there, but at points it, and, uh, between 2012 and 2016, it actually increased by about 50%. It went from 2.2 million square miles to 3.3 million square miles. So my point is, uh, or I guess my question is, do each of you believe that the science on climate is settled? The science on climate has reached considerable consensus. There are still areas where we're not completely clear about what is going to happen, partly because we don't know what policies we're going to pursue. And with regard to using one paper, one of the things no, that the IPCC tries to do is to look at a whole range of research papers and assess um, and judge um, what those say collectively rather than looking at just one paper. Well, and it's not just one paper. There are a number of, um, uh, there's a no number of examples that indicate that the science is not completely settled, although I think uh, the consensus is, is that the climate is changing. I'm not sure that the consensus is that it's all uh, anthropomorphic. I'm certain it's not the consensus that it's all anthropomorphic. And when we talk about uh, eliminating uh, all carbon emissions from the United States in the next 10 years, even uh, Senator, former Secretary of State John Kerry admits that that will not mitigate uh, climate change, will not mitigate warming, uh, basically uh, has us standing alone. And there are obviously consequences for the policies that, that we develop. In California right now, there's a lawsuit been filed by a minority group uh, uh, against uh, the California Air Resources Board uh, because of the harm that's doing to, to low-income people. Uh, since the effective date of California's greenhouse gas reduction law, the Global Warming Solutions Act, uh, 41 states have reduced their per, cap per capita greenhouse gas emissions more than California, but it's had an enormously negative impact on, on people in California. So I think we got to look at this in the, the broader spectrum, sp spectrum of how this affects everybody. And the U.S., uh, obviously, I think we continue to invest in the technologies uh, to reduce our carbon emissions. I'm all for that. Uh, I think we have to look at the whole picture of climate change because I think that uh, natural variation is going to be the bigger factor in this. And if we're not taking steps to, to engineer solutions, use our technology or engineer exper expertise to adapt and mitigate, and we just focus on, on uh, the carbon side of things, we're going to be in big trouble. We will not be prepared for the consequences of that inaction. Uh, I would agree, and so would IPCC and the National Climate Assessment, that we need to do a lot to focus on how we cope with extreme climate and global warming, whilst at the same time looking at reducing our carbon emissions. That the importance of adaptation is uh, very important, both for the disadvantaged and for businesses across the United States. Well, since I got an agreement, I'll yield back. Well, I want to thank the witnesses here today. I think you've helped us set the table, Dr. Liverman, to, to review the, uh, your work and the scientific consensus across the globe that we are not on track to reducing carbon emissions. Yes, we must and we will have uh, hearings focused on solutions regarding adaptation and mitigation, but they're simply not a substitute for tackling the source 
of the problem, and that's the increase in greenhouse gases. So thank you to the witnesses for your testimony, and the committee is adjourned.